Right, I'm going to have to show you all in, uh, in bits. Uh, okay, so you guys first, because there's lots of you. Here, it's a very disturbing image. Warning, so if you don't want to watch it, close your eyes. If you do, watch it, but there is violence in this, in this video, yeah? Did you all hear that? Okay. Most of these attacks are not caught on camera. The most people who face uh, sexism-based, misogynistic-based, racism attacks are physically presented with Muslim women in the jazz. And you probably know that, but if you didn't, that I think made it clear. Um, and children, in fact. These brave people uh, uh, also uh, uh, attack children in schools. There's something else I'll show you at the end, just to, you know, top and tail with, a, with video. So I'm just going to go through some things. I've, I've put it all down to make sure I don't forget stuff. Um, but, can I first ask, what would you like, what do you expect, what do you want out of this workshop? Anything? Well, I can do what I can. <laughs> I'll do my best. Basically, uh, again, my name is Samantha Asamadi. I'm founder of an uh, organisation platform called Media Diversified. Uh, I'm also a former, ja former journalist, or foreign, former foreign correspondent journalist, uh, where I was based in the Great Lakes region and we used to do the breaking news and various news features uh, video for uh, CNN mainly, uh, AFP, Deutsche Villa, various people, or who don't pay enough. And then also, but my main thing is I'm a documentary filmmaker. Uh, website www.thefeministfilmmaker.com. And uh, my latest film is about immigration go home bands. Do you ever remember the go home bands that were in London? Maybe were they up here as well? Yeah. A group, seven universities, did research over a year and a half about it. Um, it's really disturbing. I'll, I'll give you the link later if you want to watch the video. Of, of, uh, What's uplifting about that is that there was a lot of uh, resistance. And that's why I come and do some talks and, you know, one, to say, you know, there is resistance, we're not powerless. Two, to recruit writers, which I will do later. Okay, so, but this talk is specifically about how the media uh, reports on um, crimes or infractions committed by people of colour um, compared to how they report on it by uh, indigenous white people to England, let's say. I don't know what's the best term. White <coughs> Sometimes people get offended by people who are I don't get it. So, um, uh, yeah. Now, crime reporting is a, is a very important part of the media and it's a lot of what we see, but it can be really it can be used in various manners that sometimes are inflammatory, sometimes uh, uh, not well reported, sometimes with agenda, depending, you know, whatever outlet. I mean, something that, I don't know if you've worked over there, is that there's not that much difference between, you know, the Telegraph, the Times, the Guardian, and all of this. They've all got nominally left or right uh, politics, but they serve, they, they all still serve the same masters. Uh, that's what independent journalism is written um, but, so what I was going to say, what, let me go back to my iPad, make sure I don't miss anything, is that, um, yeah, we can still resist. Um, but, again, it's one, of the, one of the things we used to run a column called uh, This Week in Islamophobia. I don't know if you've ever heard of our website or whatever, but um, do, do have a look at least at that, because it's, it's the guy who writes it is actually from North, maybe you might burn them, I think. And uh, one of the one of the uh, things he, he, he wrote about is when black and Asian people make the front page, and this is the sun, uh, unveiled, you know. And generally, um, <laughs> generally when when when, uh, when the media want to talk about the visually presenting uh, uh, person of of, of Islam. Or a Muslim person, they will throw out the, the, the niqab, which is actually something that isn't 
really worn that much. It's not representative. I mean, nothing is representative of one, a, a religion that 1.7 billion people practice. You know, it's just ridiculous. And, and, and they're, they're having a laugh with us when they say, say it is. Um, but anyway, uh, it was last year or the year before, a pregnant Muslim woman was attacked in the street by skinheads, apparently because she was wearing a veil. You know, they banned the veil there. And she miscarried as a result of it, her lawyer said. A 21-year-old woman was four months pregnant and told police she was walking in the suburb of Argentum on Thursday, last week, two years ago, when she was set upon by two skinheads who ripped her veil from her head and tore her clothing. Now, we had like, yeah, God knows how many colour images on, uh, on, on Charlie Hebdo, and, you know, it rightly should be reported. But at the same time, we had Boko Haram, where 2,000 people were, were killed. I was in a cell that I'm pro now. I think I was literally the first person to write an opinion column on the 2,000 people killed uh, on, uh, by Boko Haram in, in, the, in the UK, in the UK press, which is ridiculous because we haven't got the same reach as the Guardian or whoever. And, and I was prompted by Alan Brisbridger. I called him lousy in the uh, article. And, 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 the, and the head of, uh, <coughs> what's it called? Africa, Africa on. Africa is it BBC Africa or whatever? And his program he looks on is called Focus on Africa. Yeah, he's on his Twitter feed, Justin Child, Justin Child, Justin Child. Justin Child. He literally says Focus on Africa, 2,000 people. Um, but yeah, that resulted in something interesting. So I went to the studios and uh, he invited me to the studios and we uh, talked. But the point is, um, that, I bet you didn't know that story about that woman. Or did you? Who knew that story about that woman, Federal? Two. Cool. Uh, that's good. You're looking out for stuff. So, the next thing I'm going to move on to, but I will go back to <coughs> women, uh, is the Oxford Grooming case. And the title of this workshop is based on this, on this article that we published called, uh, you know, Sex Abuse and how the media and, uh, well, the media and the sex abuse and that. And this is North, this is the, uh, of the North Yorkshire um, child abuse case. Now see this picture, I myself went to the internet, went on to, uh, I think it was a local North, North Yorkshire uh, uh, website who had each picture of this man, of these men, and I put that together, just in words, you know, blah, 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 my Photoshop wasn't working. However, this, when I go Google it, pages and pages and pages of these, these people, yeah? They both committed pretty much similar crimes, yet you have to search for this. Still, it's the only one. If you Google it, that's the only one of them all together. Google it. So, uh, the York, so just going back. So, uh, <coughs> yeah, basically, Google North Yorkshire child abuse and the entry of relevance appears fifth in the results. Google Oxford Grooming and the predictive searches practically find story after story for you. Both the stories of child abuse, both involving groups of men, and indeed one story is just a week old, whilst the other, you know, this is really work. Despite this, one story well known, first in the search results, the other one is consigned to the back pages of history. And then, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Um, okay, so the Oxford Grooming case made the national papers. There was constant <coughs> reference to the attackers as of Pakistani and East African origin. Their images were released and the names and addresses of all those involved were published. In contrast, the North Yorkshire case was covered with less, less fanfare and no national set of images were released. And, and, uh, and, and you know, it wasn't a while that we found out all of them were white men. And usually, that, the indicator of who's perpetuated a crime, if they're white, is that there's no mention that they're white. Look out there. Uh, you probably even know. You see. Uh, so when edited, I found these photos. Um, so to this day, if you Google the case, ours is the only image of the 10 white men altogether, whilst hundreds of them exist of the non-white men. But, you know, this is not the point. The point is, what, what facilitated the abuse of these girls was something we don't like, what something we do, patriarchy, misogyny, all sorts of things. And what got forgotten <coughs> was the, 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 uh, the, the victims in the whole case, because we're talking about Pakistan this and religion this and blah blah. The victims, good God, come on. So that is a problem with how people report on, uh, with, uh, in racially biased terms. And it's across the board, you'll find it, now that I've said it, you'll see it in everything. Okay, so this is another case. This is an American case, but still as interesting um, in the way it was reported. Um, so, on the July the 21st, it was 2013, the bodies of three African-American women were discovered in Cleveland, Ohio, wrapped in garbage bags, 
bagged and discarded near, uh, uh, near a garage. As the investigation went on, the women's families were grieving, it was horrific. Uh, <coughs> the news just like trickled into the national media, yet the press coverage it received failed to dominate the mainstream global media, nor did it general the level of public interest outrage one might think. Because what, at the same time, just literally about a couple of weeks between, there was a different case that happened. <coughs> Do you remember the three women, two white, one and two, who were, who were kidnapped and then, uh, you know, found their way out and released? I mean, look, all of looks really depressed. I can understand, but it, it, it'll get better. <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, do you remember that case? And there was a guy, and, you know, it moved on quickly to this other guy who was, you know, who, who saved the day and blah, blah, you know. The, the, the cycle is, is ridiculous, and the, you know. Uh, that, you all said yes. This, do you, do, 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 do you know much about this, uh, this girl? I can find it. Oh no, I hope my, uh, <laughs> Do you recognise this girl? Do you, do you know that case I'm talking about? Basically, that case of the three women murdered was by an African American man who was a copycat of another African American man, serial killer, who kills black women. Yet, yeah, you know, is that not the plot to a, to, to a thriller? Who, who should, I don't know, we, let's cast let's put Benedict Cumberbatch a bit and people might be interested because that is literally a copycat of a killer of black women, uh, black women uh, is doing it again and nobody gives a sh uh, 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 whatever. Um, so, just moving it. So, what happened as we did diversity? This really got me on my rope. Yeah, I was like, what's. I, saw, I googled and looked for all the people who'd, who'd uh, written about these three women who were kidnapped. And I, like, I contacted them on t Twitter and said, Are you going to write about these three African women, African American women who, who were found, you know, in garbage bags? Oh, God, I didn't know about it. That's really bad. I'll see if. I'll, if we, no, I'll, yeah, probably not. So, <laughs> so what happened then, always, you know, me and the rest of it, we try and be proactive, not just moan about stuff. Um, <coughs> oh, excuse me. And what happened was then, um, I asked the Telegraph, okay, what <laughs> I think I abused the Telegraph, the, the women's section on, on, on Twitter, and the editor of the, of the Telegraph, of the women's section, Emma Barnett, like, said, I think we should have a talk. <laughs> uh, this is about a year and a half ago. Since then, she's trashed me in her national paper this year, but uh, this week, but forget that. Anyway, we had a talk on the phone for half an hour. It was a very, very tense call. She was pushing back, I was pushing, you know, you know, to and fro. By the end of it, there seems to be a little bit of mutual respect, and she said, oh yeah, you can pitch any time. I said, oh, well, interestingly enough, I'd like to, there's a story about these African Americans that want the Oh yeah, but how does it relate to women? I mean, there's lots of it because there's lots of missing black women in the UK and dead and dead. So, okay, I literally had to. I'm not going to use the word bet because I don't bet to anybody. But I, yeah, force the case just for her to write about these black dead women killed by a serial killer who copycats another serial killer. So uh, and okay, so because uh, I don't write very often myself. I asked uh, a writer to write it, a, a, a woman uh, called Joy, <coughs> and she did a pitch, a fantastic pitch for, uh, for Emma, and it was accepted. And so to this day, if you're looking for an article about these women, <coughs> in, the, in the UK paper, when you Google it, you will find Joy's article, you'll find our writer's colour at the bottom, you know, she's a member. She wrote a fantastic article uh, about these women, and it was called, uh, which Emma probably chose the, uh, the title, Why a Black Free uh, Women Victim <coughs> Seemingly Invisible. Um, <coughs> so, and I'll tell you. So, I'm going to read a little bit of Joy's uh, article. In the UK, if asked about cases of missing children, most will be aware only of the disappearance of Madeleine McCann in 2007, despite a child being reported missing every three minutes. While her disappearance is no doubt a huge tragedy, Never say that word. We have to wonder why it is Madeleine McCann, a pretty white girl who has captured the sympathy of the public, and not girls with names like Amina Khan, Elizabeth Ongabayibi, or Foliwio Oladejo, all of whom are listed on Missing Kids UK. Uh, yeah, finger out. So uh, we, as an organisation, started in two, July 2013. We started with the hashtag. <laughs> All white front pages, which caught the imagination <coughs> of a lot of quite a few people. And the Guardian got in contact with Willie Wright. Right, right, right. um, this.
this picture was used as a lot of marketing. Do you remember that when uh, Henley won Wimbledon? When I was at, in secondary school, and I, uh, I, uh, <coughs> oh, well, I Because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, uh, I did this last night, and I, I didn't really brief everything as much as I should have done. So after the grooming scandal in uh, which one? Well, there's a couple. But okay, Rochdale. Um, <laughs> local leaders said that there was unprecedented and unacceptable racism after 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 it happened. Uh, after, well, <coughs> not even after it happened. After reporting of it happened, um, <coughs> and. Whatever you go back with, please know that I care about the girls and the victims. We all should, and that's the point, and that's where I said, you know, we get lost. And um, so a group of local leaders came together to, uh, to, to speak out about the rise in violence and discrimination they said Asian people were being subjected to following the town's grooming scandal, the media reporting on. And members of the Muslim community said, uh, there are blah, 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 blah. A group of leaders, do I repeat them? Okay. Violence and discrimination. They say the excessive focus on the ethnicity and religion of non white sex offenders has led to the stigmatization of the community, meaning that Islamophobia is now an acceptable norm. After the week's reporting, I'll, I'll send the links, that's what it, that is very correct. The group, a coalition of local leaders under the name of Rochdale Muslim Community, say they now want to work with people in the town to eradicate the hatred. In the statement, they say, it's become evident to anyone that follows events in the media that Islam is being portrayed negatively and that Muslims living in Britain are bearing the brunt of discrimination and violence. There's little doubt that this has resulted in not only the community feeling vilified, but could potentially break down social cohesion within, the, within society. Irresponsible, <coughs> irresponsible comments from senior local and national politicians are aided the negative perception. Okay, so a little story, I didn't something I read. After the boomers, there's you know, cab companies in that area. <coughs> one cab company, one bright spark who owned a cab company, um, said that he would offer his clients either white drivers or non-white drivers. I don't know if that's even illegal, but anyway, the cab drivers weren't, weren't, um, weren't, weren't too happy. I understand. <laughs> Perhaps the white ones, but I have no idea. Um, because at that time, they were still actually getting their cars were being attacked and, and you know, they themselves and their families and daughters. You know, and this is literally because of the media reporting. Yeah, there's nothing, it's, it's, you know, people have internal prejudices, but they're violent up by all the things. You know, recently, uh, the guy who, 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 who burned a, a, a mosque in America after, I don't even know what it was after, uh, he said, yeah, I was watching Fox News and it's just riled me up and I have to do something. The media is very powerful, very, very, very powerful. Um, <coughs> And you know, I've been oh, complicit. I've worked in mainstream media. Uh, I've worked for a lot of mainstream media companies, and I hope. I mean, my biggest uh, maxim is, is do no harm, because especially Western people going into Africa and stuff can really do some harm. I did myself and my partner at the time inadvertently did some harm when we were in Africa, you know, uh, in Uganda, uh, the beginning stages. I think we learned after a while. But you know, I saw other, you know, Eton educated, Oxford educated, private school boys, just, you know, callous nonsense that got people beaten up. Um, <coughs> so do no harm if you're thinking of becoming a journalist. Uh, we'll try, <coughs> try your best not to. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So we're nearly coming to the, what time is it? <coughs> 25, oh, we've got loads of time. I'll show you another video at the end. It's not, it's, well, it's this then. Okay, so another media thing that came out uh, as a direct thing with the, uh, the government's policy, Nursery staff to be forced to report toddlers at risk of becoming <coughs> terrorists. See that little boy? There's a boy. Apparently, 
he could be a terrorist. That's what the government say. So it's the part of the department's consultation over ways to enhance its anti-terrorism strategy. Prevent <coughs> Critics have dismissed the proposal as being unnecessarily draconian and turning staff who are meant to be caring for youngsters into spies. Uh, <coughs> it can, uh, it's, it, I think it's covered by most of the I first read it in, I think, Nursery World. Yeah. Got credit UK, but then the independent reported it. Yeah, it's not. It's mm. maybe end of last year, I think. Um, <coughs> okay, it continues. Staff are expected to identify children at risk of being drawn into terrorism and challenge extremist ideas, which can be used to legitimise <coughs> terrorism. The Home Office said it would not expect the hypothetical situation of a young child being taught that non-Muslims are wicked to be ignored. Equally, anti-Semitic comments made in front of the nursery worker. I've cut myself off with it. I'm just saying, isn't that surely more about parents, right? It's more saying we're going to think the kids being influenced by the parents. Yeah, it's about the parents. Possible parents, but not even the parents. Yeah, it's saying through the, uh, through, through, yeah, it's power stuff. It's always about power, isn't it? But they're looking at, <coughs> they're looking at the parents and they're identifying the parents as, uh, you know, seditious or something through the child, but the child is also discriminated against. Um, and shouldn't, you know, nursery workers should be just allowed to do their nursery work. Uh, I don't know what the status of that is currently, but um, it doesn't look good. Um, okay, so what resulted out of that was a, was a, a hashtag, <coughs> hashtag on Twitter. How many people use Twitter, I think? <coughs> Not that many. Anyway, at Writers of Colour uh, are very great current uh, Hashtag is the trashies. You can find <laughs> lots of bad journals in there. But anyway, a great uh, <laughs> um, hashtag arose out of that story called uh, Toddler Terror. Have a look on, on uh, just, you can still <coughs> find stuff now. Just uh, click on Toddler Terror and you'll find a lot of people having a laugh about really like ridiculous laws. Like, what the hell is going on? Um, <coughs> but uh, I'm going to show you one of the videos that's under that weapon. But we're going to do a Q&A, don't we? Um, so, so, anti is, <coughs> so, so you can see I've gone back and forth, anti-Islamic sentiments uh, are <coughs> women face the front of it. Basically, the West perpetuates a certain type of Muslim who considers Islam, terrorism, and the Middle East. The man will always be brown, hooked nose, bushy eyebrows, with a beard of some length, a manic look, an open, snarling mouth, no doubt illustrated to project portray a, a person of hate, spouting bigotry against the ideals of the West. The woman will always be found in some form of headscarf, a niqab or burqa. She will be with a, <coughs> two to three other women dressed similarly, perhaps looking meek or obedient to suit the Western perception that women of, of Islam are oppressed. So when the West use these characters, caricatures of Islam, the victims of anti-Islamic sentiments are women and men who fit the above physical description. Um, <coughs> It's also interesting to note that Islamic women who match the Western perception face a greater level of danger from racist or anti-Muslim components. Um, I already told you about the woman, the pregnant woman last year. I showed you that frankly horrible video. Um, <coughs> but you know, who know I, there are some groups that, that collate the information about after the attack about how many people attacked, the prevention rather than the cure. I think. But anyway. So you, you can look that up if you, if you want to, but who knows how, how much and how many this is happening to. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to show you a very short video. Thoughts you might see, so I'll just uh, go on through that, and then I'll then we'll do Q&A, I guess. I came across that by a hashtag called uh, Talk of Terror. No, I think that's pretty terrible. Uh, <laughs> and I think their parents are terrorists. It's a lonely word, but you know, whatever. Because you know, whatever, four years old, you don't, you don't, like, you, just, you, you don't start that stuff <laughs> out of the blue, do you? Never. That's come from parents or whoever they hang around the community. Let's like, let's not uh, uh, give a big word to the community that they're in, that they would be singing that. I mean, if we didn't know what the word means, but yeah, so that, to me, is total terror. When we're gonna, when we're gonna tackle that. Um, so, okay, so this week, okay.
I'm going to just tell you to go to the website www.mediadiversified.org, like uh, search for ISIS, and you'll see all our reported. We usually we don't really do reactions uh, articles, but we did decide to do reaction articles this week. Well, we pitched them, and we also have a column blah, 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 uh, about uh, the the uh, the articles written by Grace Den, Emma Barnett, and somebody else on the uh, on the girls, the school girls that went to apparently went to Syria. Uh, those, these three, you know, really well-paid uh, communists wrote really awful, misogynistic articles about these women, which, you know, I, because I like to Google, I went back and, you know, found articles they'd written about other women, girls, that's not women, girls who've been groomed, and somehow the tone was slightly uh, more sympathetic. For this, uh, it was just disastrous. Read, read those and read our responses, and, you know, I got very irritated by BBC Free Speech, who, uh, who, make, who, who took a section of Grace's uh, article entitled The Girls Who Were Going to Join ISIS Should Just Stay There. Uh, and they took a bit of a speech, put it you know, on a nice fancy thing with BBC Free Speech. Said, what the hell are you putting on? What is this? Her words seem, and read this, they said. And uh, I hassled them. Uh, and then they, uh, then they <laughs> took some of our words, put them there, and said, this is for debate. You know, like the first one should be for debate. Also, at the same time, we had Emma Barnett and Grace then being asked to go on, on to TV and radio to tell about ISIS and, uh, yeah, terrorism experts. And, you know, no. Um, but, yes, that's the end. Read the website and who's got questions? Uh, it's, it's not my own question. It's more of a statement. I'm just saying... You know, it, it's constant overload, you know, every time you have to switch on TV news, every time you read newspaper online, like, in the first few headlines of newspaper, you know, there's something about most things on, ter on terrorism and you can't get away from it. Mm -hmm. um, and I find it quite disturbing, you know, about it's just too much. Yeah, and there's really, just this week, there's that poll that came out, where it's a poll of a thousand reasons, asked oh, really stupid questions and then wrote really bad, like, formulated, structured uh, uh, articles saying, beware Muslims in the country. And the Times did a little comic uh, of a woman in a niqab uh, holding a Tesco bag saying 75% just me, Charlie. It's just awful. And the point was, Yeah. 
He was love as well. But yeah. But, but <laughs> I don't think I answered it. Well, it, it's possibly an unanswerable question, right? But I mean, I'm, I'm just expressing concern about the fact that, you know, I'm very interested and concerned about, you know, all kinds of feminisms mm. and anti racism, all kinds of anti racism. <coughs> and yet, I'm, I, and I know quite a lot about how the media operates, mm. and yet I'm not finding out easily about that stuff okay. and so it's more a thing about how can we Yeah, I thought we need a sort of central newsletter. I mean, I think I'm on some academic newsletter, a load of waffle, but occasionally come across something good. But we actually did a feminism series last year called Complicit No More, which okay. we turned into an ebook. You can see some of the articles still on the website. Also, yeah. Feminist Review, as I said, my website is called thefeministfilmmaker.com, and they got me in to film the, uh, an event they did. And they, you know, the Feminist Review did great work, and our academic curator is a uh, part of their uh, <coughs> editorial, blah, blah, blah. Um, who else is doing stuff? Yeah, yeah. There's more, but I can't say. But if you want to email me, I'll give you the links and stuff. Um, not very I just thought this question just a moment ago. But, uh, what do you think of like um, the BBC and their um, um, their I don't know what what they present as programmes for uh, women oh. um, and and how they represent ethnic minorities. On screen. On the screen, um, and I guess just... Um, Generally. Yeah, I mean, I listen to Radio 4 at work, and obviously Women's Hour is yeah. probably aimed at me, but I do, yeah. you know, I like to listen to it. I've been on Women's Hour, it's awful. Well, this is well, it. Well, it's radio experience. It doesn't really impress me very much, though. It's yeah. not people go up well, to aim at me, she, but she just doesn't understand. I don't have to be a man to, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, you should be listening. Yeah, women are trying, you know, to... How that relates to them. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I just like, oh, yeah, I don't, I'm not impressed by it particularly. Yeah, I don't yeah. think it's. Uh, I can't say I watch too much of BBC. I know about behind the scenes. <laughs> um, I'll start there, but then I'll go on to on screen, on screen and radio. Uh, so, behind the scenes, <laughs> so as I said, I'm a director, I'm a documentary, and I went to a meeting at Directors UK, who are the union, trade union for directors, film and TV <laughs> in the UK. And it was a meeting of black and brown uh, directors. And this is amazing. It's the first time I've been in a room with so many like, people who, who, who do similar big well, They're actually better than me. I don't really do enough anymore. But um, so, Directors UK have done a survey of 55,000 programmes uh, broadcast in the last year, yeah, however many years. Not that, not that many years. And they've, I can't tell you exact percentages because they're going to do a campaign about it. But let's say, it doesn't match the, the percentages of black and Asian people in the UK. <laughs> That's not enough. Okay, well you promise not to say anything. Don't spread it, don't tweet it. 98.1% of things that went on TV were directed by yeah, 98. Incredible. That's incredible. And that's why you get the output. Yeah. And that's the producers, they didn't, they didn't look at producers, but I think it's all very similar. Um, so yeah, that's where I start my start point where you see uh, TV on screen for feminist feminist stuff. You say? Oh yeah, I, I guess you know that, that ties into another thing because obviously you get women who don't consider themselves to yeah, be yeah. feminist or yeah. consider feminism to be like some sort of something. That yeah, they don't it's want hard to, be a part to define. Of. I try and so, stay away from it. <laughs> Different definitions. I guess like it. the sort of gender stereotyping. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, this week they did have a, a lady on who was a feminist. Um, on what? Uh, women's Hour. Oh, uh, okay. Um, don't they often? I don't listen to it now. I hate them. Um, she, <laughs> it's so horrible to me. Sorry, I'm useless with like, the, deep, no, the detail. Fair. But she, um, she's basically written a book um, about her. She's an Irish lady and she's written a book about her experiences of feminism and um, kind of like, yeah, on a personal level and talking about the sort of like. Um, the, uh, the the uh, the conflict between social uh, comfort being comfortable on a social level and being comfortable with um, her, um, what she believed to be like the right thing to do. So I mean, this is like talking about like uh, you know shaving your legs, and it's kind of like you know for the BBC, that's like the thing which is like a sort of tantalising detail yeah, yeah, yeah. if you are a feminist, you know, is really like not... There's lots of things that can be... Asking her about that, it's like, oh, what's it like being on the tube? 
move shaved legs. And she made a really good point. She's like, well, you know, maybe socially, I'm, you know, I'm not comfortable, but my, what my beliefs are, I know that I'm being true to myself. And I was like, you know, fair play. That's, you know, I wish more people could, could break out of that kind of like cycle. Um, but I just think that, you know, women's are, and, you know, I guess what my original point was that um, I don't know whether they, you know, I don't think they do enough um, in the BBC is you know viewed by a lot of people who don't necessarily mm. the things that bring us to, to this thing here today I guess like uh, for all the people that aren't here and don't think about these things you know they see the BBC as like a bastion yeah, of, yeah, 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 yeah. of you know and, what, and what things and are. trustworthy yeah trustworthy yeah, yeah exactly and I don't okay. think they necessarily <coughs> like, um, okay so remedies for this rather than completely uh, they didn't have more women directors, more women written content. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's, it's who's right. If something's wrong, yeah. they rather they try and like, yeah, let's, call, yeah, yeah. let's call a spade a spade. It's like, yeah. let's just say that's wrong. Yeah. What I mean? they, well, what's interesting, I went, last year was it, I went, I was invited by the, by Helen Lewis, you know, of the New States, to go to the Women in Journalism meeting at New Zealand. I, I would definitely point, and then you, yeah. Um, so it's save your arms. Uh, at uh, News International, which is one of the beast, uh, and chaired by Eleanor Hagen, I think she's the, she's, the, she's, the, she's the editor of the Times or Weekend Editor, something. Big shot. And I was the only black woman there, <coughs> for one. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, Jenny Murray, I believe, was there. Um, this was before she interviewed me. So I don't know what I said to a friend. <laughs> she, 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 whatever. Uh, is, you know, we're all talking about our various experiences in the media and sex. And stuff. I haven't actually been asked back since, but whatever. I'll get over it. Um, I have got over it. You know, but, um, but, but yeah, as, as I said, in a room of people that they think are influences within the media, I was the only black person there. So not that you know they had to have loads more, but you just see you get different perspectives. The more diversity you have in the room, we've got an article called "Blacks Around the Table." It's looking at the academy, the, you know, how many professors and blah 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 blah. And if you don't have black people or Asian people around the, the, the table, then you don't get a, a, a diverse conversation. If you don't have feminists around the table, you don't get a diverse. So it's not you know it's for their benefit. Actually, and that's, that's something that should come out of it. It's for the benefit of the media if they include all these different voices. Um, is that right? Yes, of course. Yes, have a good conversation. I know. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, no, I was just going to say, I went to this thing last February, I think it was, that really interested in, and it was part of their End Voices in This Generation project. And oh. One, one, one of the things that I thought was really good that it sounded like a really um, Sort of like odd pledge they wanted you to make, but they were sort of saying like, if you want everyone to make like a pledge big or small and all this sort of thing, one of the best things that you can do is pledge to read more like BME authors. Mm. And so I was like, okay, it's <coughs> a bit. You know, you sort of feel like, how's that going to make like an enormous difference or anything like that? Oh, it makes a massive but, difference. But then, because you know, when you sort of think like when the whole feminism thing, like when you said about like, oh, <coughs> like domestic violence is more important than like leg shaving, you know, I sort of feel like, isn't there something more like I can do, like, I don't know, like, good? fight the MP somewhere else. <laughs> 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 the the yeah, but then I <laughs> but then like I don't know, I sort of made a concerted effort after that to be reading more sort of black authors and you sort of realise that, you know, you've not made a concerted effort to be reading only white authors, but like how yeah. but like how white your kind of reading has been and like Well you think of the journalists who like, tweet, you know yeah. the Quite well known journalists, they tweet and people read the thing because they trust yeah. them, blah blah blah. Look at who they tweet, uh, whose articles they tweet, and it's usually in their own image. It's very rare, I mean, they very rarely tweet our stuff, you know. But that, like that's how I found out about Media Diversified because, um, as well as obviously, like authors wanted to read more sort of black journalism and like Media Diversified, Black Girl Dangerous, mm. uh, stuff by Renia Le Lodge, mm -hmm. who's like, yeah, yeah. Really bang on the staff. Well, yeah, yeah she's a celebrity now. But <laughs> please, no, there's lots of really good writers. They don't have to be celebrities. Owen Jones, I for me, is the best way. He caught, you know, Nafiz earlier, he mentioned uh, Owen's article on, on, on HSBC and blah blah and Scott Trice. Well, I challenged Owen about that, and he called me bitter and angry. So, <laughs> fuck <laughs> That's what I can say. So, yeah, the best, the 
those well-known writers are not the best writers. I mean, he got a little bit offended. I said to you know, I didn't actually tweet it to him, but he seems to manage to find it. I said, did this, did you, can you not afford an editor, Guardian? Because this is very stilted, and so on. And it just wasn't well written. He can write well sometimes, but it's, uh, but yeah, it's very friendly. And they're not always the best. They're just your, your names, and they're your faves. There's lots of really, really good art, uh, writers out there who I try and come to and get, and, you know, I'm always looking. Uh, and, you know, not just me. Everybody's looking for good writers, but some people become celebrities. And then they're not, you know, there's no the critical look at, Look at stuff. So, do you know each other? Sorry, you look familiar. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose my question was, um, from your experience, how much of it, I suppose, is conscious and unconscious? I mean, when you're imagining the sort of editorial meetings at BBC or the Sun or whatever, do you kind of envisage it as them saying, all right, how can we scapegoat lose money some more? Or is it a case that it's something where Writers aren't even aware that they're yeah, doing it, they yeah. just do it a lot and it happens. But then equally, when they do it, it tends to sell papers. So yeah. They must well be aware. Yeah. There's, there's lots of things going on. Yeah, that's, yeah. Like, that's a good question to unpack, actually. Um, so, I, was, I went to Berlin last November and I was on a panel uh, about media and minorities and looking at the effects of media and minorities. And I sat on a panel in Germany, in the, the Jewish Museum, <coughs> beautiful place. Uh, two, uh, two guys, one from a left-wing paper, another from the equivalent of BBC, their uh, cultural desk, and uh, a right-wing sort of uh, independent uh, journalist there. And he says, it just, but uh, he was absolutely adamant that there's no bias, there's nothing wrong with what they do. You know, once I spoke about that, like, what's happening, I should have shown him a bloody video. But, um, so they don't think there is. One, yes, there's unconscious bias in everything, you know, it's why if I send a CV and you send a CV, mine will get put to the bottom of the pile and yours will stay up because, you know, you have a name that isn't uh, uh, presenting as uh, the other. Um, there's that, uh, and when you're in the room, obviously. But there is, and I'm not even going to, I don't want to distinguish between left and right media anymore. There's no point. They've all got their various good and bad points. and and and. So I could say like the agenda of the Telegraph is to serve their, their banking masters. Uh, and I could say the Guardian is to be the liberal bastion. Uh, and they, out of everybody, has probably been the best on, on not discriminating on, on, on uh, Muslims and Islam in, in some ways, but they also have Jonathan Friedland who works there and, you know, People have issues with him. I, I don't read his stuff because you know I have life. Um, but so 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 agenda-wise, the Telegraph, I would say, do have, and they seem to be increasing, an agenda regarding uh, Islam and blah blah. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's just because of racism or whatever. I think yes, it sells papers. Uh, it, 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 it helps that their audience. If you go to the comments on the Telegraph. Uh, just don't oh, give it just, Yeah, this is, you know, there might as well be steam, piling steam, steam coming off it. Um, but their writers, their readers like those sort of articles, you know, what was a, a headline last week? Are you worried about British Muslims? This is what you can do about them. It's just crazy. Um, and then they had this poll as well, they jumped on this poll that I was talking about. <coughs> Uh, recently, <coughs> yeah. so uh, so yeah, you can say they've got an issue. Though the Times, I thought they the other day, you know, the poll. Um, <coughs> David Aronovich wrote an article about it, and I can't remember what it was called, but I tweeted him about it. Uh, we've been in touch before. I I I, I really didn't used to like him. I still don't like his uh, his. Writing, not the style of writing, that's fine, just the tickies. Uh, I, I think it was liberal, uh, muscular liberal. Uh, but you know, he contacted me after Kathy Newman's lies, and the Twitter people are going to know about that. And because we went in hard about that because we feel that she lied, or she did lie, and she created you know, death threats against this mosque when she lied about being told to leave, no, being oh. ushered out of the mosque. Yeah. Remember that story? Hopefully, you know, you know that that was exposed as a lie. Uh, we went in hard on it on Twitter. I mean, really, like, and you know, I had, I've got an anonymous, anonymous uh, writer who, who does little uh, uh, fiction for us, and he wrote about uh, 
uh, Kathy, what's he called? Kathy Cream Carell or whatever, Katie Hay. Anyway, uh, so I guess David Aronovich at some point uh, realised that this was a deal and he contacted me on Twitter and said, why don't you, you and Kathy, you're like, you know, you're good people, why don't you meet? So presumably Kathy had reached out, these people are going in half of us and she wanted to talk to us. Anyway, for, uh, for the blood, I gave you my number, all this stuff. But in the meantime, Channel 4 finally woke up and made an apology, she made a semi-apology, blah, blah, blah. But David Aronovich, yeah, he wrote about uh, the poll and it was a really bad, the title was okay, the leader was absolutely awful, you know, British militia, you'd be scared and all of this nonsense. And I, I, I tweeted him and said, you know, what's going on here, blah, blah. <coughs> and he said, yeah, uh, oh, I didn't write that bit. And, uh, and it turned, and I was like, what, he, has the Times got an agenda? And um, he told me that no, they don't have an agenda, it's, you know, it's, it's about what's, what sells, what's blah, blah. So I said, all right, so it's not, it's not the uh, Islamophobic agenda, it's the, it's the bottom line rather than, you know, the editorial line. Um, so this happens um, far more than it should do. It probably happens at the Guardian. I don't know. It's enough. You know, I start, I start, like when I read mainstream press, it's because you know someone sends it to us or whatever. Problematic. There's lots of independent press you can read that will give you a lot more information in my in, in a, not in a non-biased way because you don't have to be non-biased. Uh, you just have to report the facts and then give your opinion because then they can make it up. You know, they don't have to read the last couple. Whatever. Paragraph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, I wondered if you could tell us something about the way the media portrays anti-racism. Because <coughs> ever since Charlie Hebdo, um, Muslims who talk about Islamophobia are defined as non-violent extremists. And so they're defined as... Yeah. Oh, don't you really love that thing? Moderate Muslim. Yeah. So they're defined as fueling the grievances <laughs> of people who go on to join ISIS or whatever. Mm. Um, <coughs> How the media reports on anti-racism activists or just anti-racism in general? In general, okay. It depends. There are, okay, you can identify certain journalists who are very consistent and quite good on anti-racism. Uh, you've got people like Joseph Harker at the Guardian who, uh, who, you know, every time he writes an article, he doesn't do it very often, it's always an event, it's fantastic. Uh, he's on point every single time. Uh, I don't think he should have bothered writing about Benedict Cumberbatch, Cumberbatch, but whatever. Other than that, he's always on point. And then you've got <coughs> a few other, you know, Gary Young, on America. Um, but generally, okay, so the article, that we got called out about in the, in the Telegraph this week by Emma Barton. said, oh, uh, the title was, Racism is alive and kicking in Britain, but I'm not one of them. The leader <laughs> said, after a week of full fat racism from the UKIPs and blah, blah, why are people attacking blah, blah, blah? That is how the media reports on anti-racism. They get a white person to write it, Feel free to write, uh, but you know, <coughs> you get stuff like she's telling us what is racism, and uh, that, that, that's a, that's a real worry. I think you know people should, everybody should write about the um, social issues which which the racism is, but you know, cite <coughs> some black authors or Asian authors because they have the lived experience of it. Whatever, if you're intersectional feminism or whatever, blah blah. Actually citing people with authority is a good idea, regardless. You know, she didn't she didn't cite anybody, she just said, this is racism, that isn't, this is ridiculous. Um, so the times I don't know so much. I mean they've got Catelyn Moran there and she she has actually been somebody who supported us at the you know, beginning of uh, the, the, the you know, she donated money a couple of times for a Pixar, she got blah to like articles, which you know immediately goes viral, you get approval, blah blah. Um, and I don't know, I mean, she gets a lot of attacks on Twitter, so I don't know if she actually writes about racism and that. Who, who's got a subscription to the Times? Nobody. Huh? Does someone, anybody? No, not a single person in this room. I read it occasionally. Huh? I read it occasionally. 
Okay, well, tell me, what, what are they like on anti-racism? I've no idea. They don't really cover it very much. Um. Okay. Uh, times, okay, independent. Independent get better. Independent make me laugh in some ways because uh, this is all being recorded. I am happy to go on record about this. Uh, but um, she's, <laughs> they, they, they are normally quite good on anti racism and stuff. And their, their indie voices section is the equivalent of Comet is Free in the Guardian. And there you get a lot more black and Asian voices. And they spent the time where they kept contacting me asking for writers to write about this case and that case of racism and blah blah, but not about anything else. And I got sick of it. I said, for what? You don't pay them, but do you don't pay me? Why on earth am I going to find like this LGBT queer blah blah to talk about? Them? Just go and find them yourselves. You know, absolutely useless. So uh, yeah, they're better, but you know, look at the structures of how they do things, and then it gets all a bit more, uh, more interesting. Uh, any more papers? Uh, Daily Mail. <coughs> right. So there's a Daily Mail, Occupy Daily Mail, uh, uh, of week starting. Oh no, that's now. That's now. And then there's Occupy Rupert Murdoch in end of March. You should all get involved, get interested, do something like that. The Daily Mail are interested because I probably don't have the traditional view of the leftist love of God on the Daily Mail. I think generally it's terrible. However, they have a lot of resources. They've got a lot of money. They can actually put out a story that other places will not report or not have resources to follow that story. Unfortunately, even with those resources, it doesn't mean they put them in the right place. In Black Earth News, going back to that again, there's an interesting story that Nick Davies reports where he said, you know, he talked to a daily man once who was going up the road, you know, up to the end floor, going blah blah blah, because uh, three people had been killed by their husband. Driving, driving, getting there, gets a call back from the daily man desk. Uh, turn back, I said, oh, I'm really dead. I said, oh, they're black. Huh? You had the resources, you had the car, you know, you had the petrol, but they turned into tell back. So, yes, occasionally they do report on really good things, but often we don't know what they're not doing. And that's my problem with them, but I'm not willing to shut them down. I'd like them to change owners, and I'd like them to employ more black people in the top levels. And that is me for everything, you know. Put people on the top levels, we're not interns, we're God, professionals. Scott, yeah, any questions? What time is it? One minute past three. Whatever, I think I've done my time. <laughs> I'm going to go and lie down.